Hello, all you beautiful book lovers out there, all you wonderful future authors and educators of the publishing world. It is Maccabee again with the walking vial of chaos herself with diplomatic immunity, Miss Chelsea Rice. Uh, Chelsea, we missed you on the last one. I know. It was such a sorrowful day. Sure, it was it, good. It, Not as exciting if I was there but I'm sure you did okay by yourself. Well, I appreciate that. Thank mm -hmm. you. Um, it was, it was kind of boring. Honestly, I, I was, I was getting used to the rants and everything, you know, I know it's, it's, it's so everybody always says that I, I appear as to be one of those quiet people that everybody just kind of leaves alone and then they get used to me or that I get comfortable around them. So like I start talking and then when I'm not around, they're just like, okay, something's missing. But I'm not a very social person. Like doing it over online, no big deal. But like in person, I'm just like, no. When was the last time you washed your hands? Did you just sneeze? Did you cough? Like what is going on? Stay out of my bubble. I think I'm getting paranoid in my old age. Like I'm just like, mm. yeah, yeah, th yeah. That old age of yours, you know. What can I say? <laughs> <laughs> For everybody else, she Chelsea is very young. She she okay. thinks herself an old an old <laughs> an old soul, but she honestly isn't. Um, no, today today's guest is going to be very interesting. As you heard in our previous episode, we talked a lot about everything from uh, historical fiction, what it is, obviously, and some of the rules and regulations basically that you should have it the important stuff about historical fiction yes uh, but also a couple other aspects that i won't talk about in this one just because you have to go find you have to go listen to it to actually hear what we're talking about and all of the important tangents and rants and ridiculous things that we end up letting slip that's why those first episodes are so important it's the it's a nice, gentle entrance into what our weekly conversation will be. That is true. That is very true. But there's also some of the things, unfortunately, we have to cut just to make sure we have time. Yes. But we will have those in the near future for subscript uh, subscriptors, subscribers. Yes. Blue for real. <laughs> yeah, you will get the overall feel of both of us. Uh, the the overall ridiculousness that comes with this, but I digress because we have a very important person on here with us who to me has shown you can talk about the more difficult subjects in a very professional and true form of writing. And especially when it comes to things such as abolitionism, slavery, the role of, roles of women in the 1800s, all kinds of things that go with that. It's but It's the evolution of who we are as people and how we, we went from a, a terrible place as a country to learning more and appreciating things and becoming kind of how we are now. Or at least trying to be. Trying, and yes. Yeah, we're still we're not we haven't completely succeeded, but it is kind of interesting if we look back at it. There's been a lot going on in the world this week. It's been pure chaos, and it's showing the reality of of humanity and how we treat things, and the sheer amount of of jokes. I think with the whole submarine thing has been blowing my mind because five people were in there and because they were billionaires, nobody seemed to care. I think that's kind of a backtracking in the the way that humans treat people. So I, I don't quite know, but we are here for historical fiction about a book that was written by a very lovely author. That will be a very lively discussion, I am sure. That is true. And you know what, without further delay, Let's bring Miss Deirdre Sennett up onto the screen. Hello, Deirdre. It's very nice to see Hi. you. Hi, Maccabee and Chelsea. I'm so glad to be here and having the conversation. And 
yeah, it's interesting times that we're in. I mean, everything is sort of feels like it's being thrown up in the air and uh, just we got to deal with it from our own moral core, I think. Which is something that you bring up a lot during the book itself, which, by the way, for everybody else, it is called The Third Mrs. Galway, a novel about all those things that we were talking about. But I'm going to let Miss Deirdre actually tell us what is your book actually about using the seven to eight word rule? So it's about will you do the right thing? That's what it's about. Six you know? words or less. I like that. For everyone. Boom. There's your eight. There you go. <laughs> yeah. she, Chelsea's always helping people out there. I am a helper. What can I say? I live to help people. Well, Ms. Deirdre, can you introduce yourself to our listeners and tell us a little bit about yourself? Specifically, something we can't find anywhere else about you except for here. I wouldn't call it oversharing, but I tend to be very frank about my journey. Um, You know, I, this book I started writing when I was in my fifties and I started writing it because I had a failed memoir that just doesn't ever need to see the light of day, but was important for me as I was learning how to write, to be working on something like that. That was a big challenge, but um, you know, the, the day that I got a really bad, critique in my writer's workshop from the leader. I, first of all, I cried in the workshop, which you're not, you know, like, no, you no one wants to see crying in the workshop. <laughs> and I'm the least likely, right? I left there saying, hey, I have this idea for a historical novel. I'm going to start working on that. And what was amazing about it was that in this case, the, the narrator just was so easy and the problem with my memoir narrator okay Deirdre the person was writing a a Deirdre the narrator who was unforgiving of Deirdre the character that those are the layers that that weren't working and I had thought I got it right this time I got it and no I hadn't So as I say, you know, you don't get to be a 60 year old debut novelist by having a straight path straight to it. And I'm forever jealous of fictional characters who like they put out a short story and the next thing you know, they have a publishing contract and they're winning awards. And I get so jealous of it. It's just it's it's absurd. I mean, (laughs) I know. I know it probably does happen to some people, but you know, (sighs) I I think it's crazy, especially as an author. I think book reward awards are just a joke. And let me tell you why. Let me explain it. Did you know there are a lot of book awards that you can buy? You can go in and you can say, Hey, I would like, it's like the reader's choice award. You can go pay $300. Your book is a reader's choice award winner. You can go and you can pay and get a couple of these other ones, like especially for your state and all of this. Like you can pay and you can have those awards. It's become a, another one of those, like we were talking about, Mac, one of the greatest scams of being an author and a lot of things that people don't know. Just like you can pay for good reviews, you can pay for book tours, you can pay for book awards, which is why a lot of times now people get excited. I have a friend named Danny. She has won the New York big book award twice. And that is, that's a serious award. Like that is one that you can't pay for, but you pay a fortune to get into the running for. But there are a lot of awards that you can pay and you, they're like, Oh, we're going to wait. And then all of a sudden there's 300 winners for that year. It's because you pay that amount. They give you either a bronze, silver or gold rating. And that is your award. So don't put your stake in awards. Yeah, no, that's complete. That's complete new information for me. It's sort of how little I know about the the back end of the publishing. I didn't world. know it. I actually went and was looking to try to find like, oh, how do you enter your book in for awards? Because the the publishing house that I was with wasn't very big into it because they're like, look, awards don't sell books, and that's completely true. However, it does give you a, a an opportunity to reach more people. So I was looking into it. 
And one of them was like, you know, this is, this is what your award would be. You get 10 seals and a digital seal that you can put on your book and all of that. And I was like, wait a second, what? Like, I didn't, I haven't even sent you my book. I haven't done anything. And it's like, oh, all you have to do is pay two ninety five. You get your digital seal, 10 physical seals, and you get added to our list. And I was like, I have never felt so curious as to how many people have actually earned their awards versus how many people have bought them. And I think it's something that maybe readers don't know as much either, but as an author, it kind of diminishes the opportunities that you see for these other authors that are getting these awards. It's like, okay, but did you buy it or did you earn it? Yes. Well, you know, in a, it shouldn't be about the money of the author. I mean, it, there's so many things out there that are like ready to hold you upside down and shake every bit of money out of, out of you. When the, amount of time, the amount of care, the amount of research that goes into uh, a book, even if it's a, even if it's a book that's not historical, you still have to do a whole lot of learning and, and all sorts of things in order to make it a quality book. And basically 99.9% .9 of authors are never, ever going to come close to recouping the, the amount of money, time, and effort that they put in. So it has to be, you. so you have to be writing it for another reason other than that. You know, not everybody gets a, a movie deal. And, and, you know, those who do, well, good for you. I'm glad, you know, I'm not going to take anything away from, from you for that success, mm -hmm. but it is tough. It's real tough. And especially for people who don't have any means, you know, like they might be fantastic authors and they don't get recognized because they can't pay $300 for that. You know, it's like. And I also think it's one of those things that ties into how every, everything is going with Amazon now. Amazon is taking away reviews from authors that are not Amazon authors. They are taking away your, your standings and eliminating your book completely off of their platform and saying it's an error and they re-upload it. But then you have none of your ratings. You have none of your reviews. You have nothing, so you're starting from scratch again. It's happened to me twice. I have had my books removed because they were flagged for being uh, like plagiarized or something. And I'm like, I can't plagiarize my own work. Like, I don't know what you're you're saying. And then they're like, oh, that was just removed by an error. We're so sorry. And it's like, no, no, you're really not. It, it is sad and it's irritating too. Uh, speaking of research, there's a lot of research that has to go into historical fiction. And this is something that we were talking about in the previous episode, too. And I believe that one of the things that many readers don't understand is what it's like to go through all that research, what it's like to have to sit down for hours upon hours to not only get the societal view on certain subjects, depending on what was going on during that year, comparative to today's uh, societal viewpoints and things of that nature. What were some of the challenges of getting your mind out of your modern mind out of the historical mind and historical fiction world that you were creating? Well, certainly it came up a couple of times where I would be thinking, let's just say about time and how accessible it is to know what time it is to down to the very second and how we parse time in a way that probably wouldn't be done by the average person if they're, if they're waiting. They might not be counting the seconds. Also time for how long things take to happen, how long it takes to get from point A to point B, especially if we're talking about enslaved people who are escaping from slavery on foot, a lot of them for most of the way. So you have to really plot out and, and take a look and see how far each town is from each other. In general, in upstate New York anyway, most towns are 10 miles between towns because that's what a coach horse could go before needing to sort of being replaced. So if you're pulling a big coach with lots of luggage and lots of people, you might have a couple of horses and they, every 10, 10 miles, they put on a fresh pair of horses. 
So how fast are they going? How fast does a, a donkey go on the Erie Canal? You know, four miles per hour is the speed limit. <laughs> so they had obviously some people going faster than that. Um, and, and just like, I had to think about it, you know, I can tell generally I have a, I have a cell phone that has the exact time and I have my computer exact time. I have, you know, older clocks and newer clocks, but it just wasn't necessarily available in, in the same way. But the people then could look up at the sky and they could reckon the time day or night based on where the sun or where the stars were. Um, and so that was one of my favorite things about researching was just like putting, you, you're right, you don't, you have to take your mind out of this particular moment and put it back there and try to understand the technology that existed in the, whatever the period is and how much it changes. For instance, I'm working on a new book, which is set in 1777. So the technology is different than 1835, not terribly different, not as quick as 19th and 20th century changes, but still, you know, what, what's the same, what's different and, you know, how can the characters effectively do what they need to do without being, um, you know, ac acronistic. So what makes you out of all of the genres choose to do not only historical fiction, but that time period? Um, it comes out of doing research for uh, sort of nonfiction and lectures about Utica in the 1835. And I didn't pick 1835. It chose me. There was this, people talk about the Underground Railroad and they talk about how uh, folks might go from Philadelphia to New York to Albany, which is on the Hudson straight up, and then across the state. Uh, to Syracuse. And if you're from upstate New York, Syracuse was in that time barely anything. And Utica was a boom town. And I grew up in Utica, so I had a little jealousy, you know, the way that Syracuse was portrayed and Utica was ignored. And I said, no, it's got to be, there's got to be Underground Railroad activity there. So I started looking in the indexes of books on the Underground Railroad and on abolition until I found the 1835 riot against the founding meeting of the New York Anti-Slavery Society. And so it's like, oh my God, you know, I who think sometimes nothing ever happened in Utica, this happened, that there was a, a riot and they had to clear the, the church that they were in and, and take off to another town in order to accomplish their, their goals to found this society, which was important in the, in New York State's abolition history. And so that got me interested. I started researching it and researching the people and speaking about it and, and getting out there to, to conferences and stuff. But still, you know, you're only talking to 20, 30 people. If you're lucky, you get 100 people that are listening. And I just knew that a story that involves someone having to choose to help somebody very different than themselves, that that was the moral core I wanted to wrap the book around. So I didn't really choose it. It chose me and um, it was, uh, it was Kismet, I guess. I love Kismet. Kismet is definitely one of those ideals that, or I can't even say ideals, ideology behind it is very much, amazing to me because and in other forms people would say it's everything's just sinking together uh you know us having this conversation us actually meeting and talking about something this actually happening after juneteenth uh, occurred uh for the second year in a row third year in a row i can't remember when juneteenth actually became an official holiday second Second year, which, by the way, was funny to me uh, when someone pointed this out, because it was like uh, it was actually my editor, Frank. He was actually looking at it. like, you're going to be talking about slavery in the same week that we had Juneteenth. And I'm like, oh, I didn't even think about that. But it, the other thing that I kind of noticed was is that you're talking more 
even more about, you know, abolitionism and all these great things that occurred and also some of the more horrific times, things that occurred during that time. But you're also expressing a point of what women's roles were at that time, too, because it was very clear to me from the beginning that when you are talking about the roles of women back in the 1800s, in this case, 1835 specifically, it was very clear and precise on who was in control of the relationships and on the ages in terms of marriage, because our protagonist, Helen, is not even 18, 19 years old when she has a gentleman who's in his middle ages, 35, 36 years old, coming in and saying to a female institute, by the way, which I didn't even think was in, was real, but I had to do my research too. And it's, sure enough, it's real that he came in almost looking for a replacement for his recently dead wife. And they didn't even court for not even a month. And he's already like, I'm proposing to you because I know where you're at. I know what I need. But that this was also it. the time period. Exactly. And that's what I like, mean. Oh, you're, you're 13. Like you're definitely ready for marriage. You're definitely ready to start a family because you're going to die in 20 years. Have you ever seen a million ways to die in the West? Like that's how I always feel like it was back then. But nowadays, it, back then it was like, oh, they've known each other a month. They've known each other forever. How are they not getting married yet? Now you're, you'll go to your friends and they'll be like, oh, I've been dating this guy six months. We're getting married. And they're like, whoa, calm down. Exactly. But here's, here's my question. Because when we're looking at what is going on today, you know, there's tons of people that are uh, getting married three days later, just met each other, uh, you know, even night was it 90 day marriage or something like that. That's on TV. Why was it so important for you to bring that up in this narrative as well? Well, when I'm trying to uh, understand the reality of somebody who is an orphan in, in Helen's case, that there is such limited things that they can do with their lives in order to survive. So she could become a maid or a housekeeper or, or a, a, a teacher or a nanny or something like that. Those are the things that are open to her. I, I even feel like because of previous sort of epoch, like the revolution, the American Revolutionary War, women had a little bit more leeway because there was this, this revolutionary up, upsurge. And I think that then there was a reaction to try to get women back, back, back into just the home sphere and to really reinforce that. I mean, it was very much the abolition movement, women who spoke, that was like really revolutionary. They weren't supposed to be doing that. They were supposed to be at home and retiring and not getting involved in politics. And they were shamed for that. Uh, the, the When you have a meeting where there's a woman talking or women attending, it's called promiscuous. It's a promiscuous assembly because there's, that, you know, that's just, this, this just where the men are supposed to be. So I think there was a, you know, how we go 10 steps forward, eight steps back, 10 steps. So I think there was a reaction after just the involvement of women in the Revolutionary War and, and in thinking about it. So th that was important, but also just the idea that you are a, the total of your being is your womb and your ability to provide an heir, provide children. I mean, he's looking there and he's thinking, oh, she's tumbling. You know, she's doing these, these this tumbling. Uh, look how much vivacious. She's got a lot of life. She's definitely going to be able to give me children. I, I was just looking at some 1910 U.S. census. And they asked a question that I hadn't seen asked before. It was, how many children have you given birth to? And how many are alive today on the day of this census. And you get to see like 11 births, you know, four living. So there's a very high death rate of children 
from all sorts of diseases. And, and so there's a practicality to this obsession with like, we need to have a bunch of kids because a lot of them may not make it. And I, that was true in 1910. It was much truer before then. So there is a certain practicality to t having somebody, you know, who's going to be able to produce enough children so that some of them survive. So, uh, so that uh, is an I issue um, that doesn't exist in the same way now. Well, depending on what culture you come from, too, there's a lot of that still going around today. And speaking of culture, I, I believe one of the greatest things that you have done on here is that you started to write in a term that's called uh, dual perspective in writing. And you're in the in this case you're not only writing from you know helen's perspective you're also writing from uh, amari's perspective which by the way for everybody else amari is a runaway slave who happens to be pregnant when helen sees her for the very first time with her 10 year old son and for me when i was looking at that it was very true to the sense that there's a lot of perspectives in terms when people actually read these about these characters it's really hard sometimes for people to get out of that modern thinking about oh how can you have a, a white woman write about what a black woman would be thinking what would you tell people about that as a writer that's coming from those two perspectives well first off i think that this is an extremely important discussion because that's there's there is always we especially in the united states we're not getting away from the difference of uh perspectives or or being able to exist in the u.s to exist as a, a white person white woman is different than to exist as an african-american woman this is one of the things that i was so you know kind of worried about there was no way i was going to try to tell this story and just from a, a perspective of the white characters it just seemed crazy to me um one of the characters who ended up i didn't know she was going to be the most so important and that was maggie um who is a formerly enslaved african-american woman who is the you know basically the whole household staff in the in the house the galway house and i showed it to a friend of mine went very early on and she said this is uh, priscilla tucker who passed away just like two years ago she said you modeled maggie after me didn't you and i'm like no 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 i didn't what are you talking about? <laughs> and a few days later i called her i said yeah yeah you're right because i knew it i knew it you know so it so in the same way that all the characters are obviously coming out of my mind, but they're also coming from, um, you know, my experience of other people and how they tell me what they're thinking about. And I don't know, I think, I think that if you want to tell a complete story, which I do, you have to take a leap and give it a try and better do it right and better do it well you know like and also not only that but to get feedback from folks who are african-american or uh, uh, indigenous or whatever kind of characters that you're putting in there people who usually get ignored in a lot of stories you know their background they're not important they're not in the foreground they're not pushing their own destiny in some way but you better make sure that they are equal in per terms of the importance in the story and their own personal stories. So with you writing the, the historical fiction format, do you have advice for people on how to keep that are trying to do something similar and write um, in different time periods about how to keep them self-separated from the modern times or if they are doing kind of an alternative history, how not to cover it? like color it too much compared to how it was? I mean, for me, I read a lot of, I still start almost all my research 
in general by looking at contemporary newspapers. And so you're getting a lot of the attitudes and uh, some of the dialogue that I put into Mrs. Galway is from of the of the white guys, particularly those who are against the the meeting, that are actually from the people who I've described actually in the book, have used their names. And so I'm taking some of the language from them. And I think reading more and more, it's always about reading. I mean, like, hmm, I got this. It's like, all. that's not all of a library. I didn't want to seem like a hoarder, you know what I mean? By sticking it all in one room, because that seems weird. So I broke it up into every room into my house. That way it's more sophisticated versus hoarder. <laughs> this is a fine line when it comes with books. I saw somebody with a t-shirt on the other day that says, it, it can't be hoarding because it's books. Exactly. Yeah. It's knowledge. Knowledge is power. I'm just my own yeah. walking library. That's the difference. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and like the physical yes. books I have are nothing compared to the digital books I have. So I always, every time I come home with books, I always tell Corey, I'm like, be very thankful because I also could have just not bought them digitally and came home with like five containers of books. So be happy with the 20 that the only the 20 that I came home with. Speaking of terminology, because I, I think that's something that's very important in bringing people into a story. While you were researching, what were some of your sources besides, you know, contemporary uh, newspapers and obviously the, some of the letters and everything back then as well? What were some of the other resources that you were using just to make sure you have the right slang that was used and the right terminology as well? The OED, for one thing, like I just was trying to, for the new novel, trying to figure out what men would call their penises uh, if they were being... Uh, you know, the, the colorful just, language that you can find out looking through history of what a man has referred to his penis as, <laughs> it's ridiculous. The OED. Can you just say, just tell us what that specifically is? It's the Oxford English Dictionary, right? Um, and it is a, basically, you can look up a word and see how it developed when it developed, what was the first time it was used? So if you have a word that you're like, oh, I'm not so sure that that's an old word, it sounds too contemporary, you look it up there and it's like from 1700, it's like, okay, it's good. And that is something that I have lucky that my husband is a book collector, hoarder. He, every book he gets, he intends to read. Uh, but you, as we all know, it's impossible. I looked up how many different words in history have there been to refer to a man's penis. And the current count is over 893 words. Amazing. Amazing. Why? Yeah. And there's, there may be a, a, a correlation with a woman's uh, Let's uh, find reproductive out. organs as well. Of course. So here we go. Of course. Let's go yeah. down this rabbit hole. It's, it's random facts. Sometimes you just like to know. Like, I don't know, maybe I could be in a life or death situation. They'd be like, approximately how many words are there to describe, to call a man's penis? I'd be like, well, funny enough, I actually know this story. Strangely, it's around 900. Yep. yep. That, uh, oh, does that keep me alive? I hope so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm just saying. Oh, my gosh. All right. Well, while she's looking up that part, mm -hmm. <laughs> let's, let's talk about some of the other events that were going on through this entire story in terms of relationships, because relationships are very important in this as well. And the different viewpoints of what a relationship is. When we're talking about Amari, Amari is, I will, I will admit to you very upfront. It was very hard for me as a black man to read that first part. That first chapter was extremely hard for me to read, but it was worth it because it, it showed me a different side when, when it comes to immersing into the book, into that world in general. 
when we're looking at the relationship between Amari and her son, Joe, and the way that we were talking about earlier about how different people had different, had to have so many children to just make sure that they had heirs per se. One of the lullabies that was said during uh, her labor of her trying to calm her baby down and calming both babies, honestly. What was it about that lullaby and where did that come from that made even Helen stop from just going and grabbing someone else to come and deal with this? I was struggling to figure out how uh, Amari could change the tenor of what was going on in the room and and in an in a way that just would stop all of the escalating uh danger for her and that character has to be extremely resourceful and extremely smart and winning but also strong in her own skin and her own words and her own actions and when i thought oh my god she could sing something and sing a lullaby i started just searching uh for early african-american lullabies and there it i i don't have the book right here with me but there's a in the acknowledgments i say where uh the song came from and they describe it as possibly it's got a terrible name uh from the from the past but they describe it as possibly from african american sources or uh native american sources and they have the music in the book so when the the lovely woman rebecca lee who did the audio book she actually sung it and it was just amazing i was just so thrilled that she did that and could do it because I go and talk and <laughs> I sing it and I warn people. I say, you know, how you have trigger warnings before you go reading. I say, okay, I have a trigger warning. I'm going to sing. And that's. <laughs> well, look that's, away now if you must. <laughs> right, right. It's, it's going to be, it's going to be me singing, which is not a great, great uh, combination. But anyway, it just, music reaches people in a different way i think in a different section of the brain and part of that is from our our mothers or our caretakers singing to us when we're young there's something about music that is much deeper uh than than words in many times that can bring up the emotions that you might not if I was saying something, please calm down or whatever, they would never have touched the, 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 the whole situation to make it go back to a safety for Amari. Amari. So she was like really, really smart and really like managed to get the right thing done at the right time. And I was so thrilled with the idea of it. But it came from me trying to live up to the character and her needs and her capacity of, uh, you know, for invention. Yeah. And, and because of the fact I have the book right in front of me, I actually looked it up. It says, Amari's Lullaby was suggested by an old song with an unprintable name from the book of the uh, book, The American Song Bag by Carl Sandburg back in 1927. Uh, Sandberg wrote, Margaret Johnson of Augusta, Georgia, heard her mother sing this year on year as the mother had learned it from the singing year on year of a Negro woman who uh, comforted children with it. The source of its language may be French, Creole, Cherokee, or mixed. To me, that explains almost literally the entire thing right there. This is this is not just a book about abolition. It's not about a book about relationships or struggles to find freedom or any of those other things. It's a song 
this is a lullaby in itself because it is history repeating itself. It's history showing, hey, this is what's going to happen if we don't get our act together again. This is something that our ancestors are sitting down and saying, hey, we've been through this. Here's some of the words. Understand it. Not Don't interpret it. Listen to it. Deirdre, thank you for being on the show again. I want to I want to close out with obviously some of our favorite questions and some of our listeners' favorite questions for you. And the first one obviously is what is your writing kryptonite? I would say that a question will come up about was there running water? Was there this? Was there that? And I have to screech to a halt because I cannot finish this sentence. I cannot skip to the next sentence. I cannot start at something else until I know how, in this case, Maggie had water in the kitchen in 1835. Not how the best house in Utica had water in the kitchen, but how did, did this person get water into the kitchen? And you know, come up with the dry sink and bucket and then pitchers of water. You know, it's just like nothing can happen now. <laughs> I cannot go forward and leave this detail to be like, oh, I'll I'll figure that out later. No, 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 no. I mean, that that's that's pretty solid. What do you have anything that you wrote for this book that you took out that you wish you had left in? I went from uh all the way across New Jersey, looking at the different towns, each little town, and each one of the ones I stopped at either had a documented Underground Railroad depot, whatever you want to call it. There is no actual Underground Railroad, but just had a safe house. And there was a whole string of them all the way, do, 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 all the way across the state. And I did such detailed, <laughs> detailed uh, research. I knew everything about them. I made, created a map and it just like, I got one thing in about them, uh, running into problems in New Jersey and had it in this uh, Chadwick's maybe, or I can't quite remember, but anyway, had it in this little town and I had all sorts of great details about how somebody might evade capture. And a lot of that I didn't, didn't fit in the book and you have to be ruthless and take out things that don't move the story forward or help to describe things. So that was, that didn't make it in. Were there any other characters besides Maggie that were based off of specific people in your life that you're able to talk about (laughs) without getting in trouble? Well, Horace, uh, Definitely, definitely Horace is based on a friend of mine. He doesn't know. I don't know if he's ever read the book, Johnny. Just a a diminutive, very active man who will do what needs to be done to get things done, who I've always admired. I think that uh, in my life, I mean, some of the characters like Mr. Galway are based on a couple of different people from that era who I knew about. One of them was uh, Brian Alexander Johnson, who was like this sort of uh, intellectual in Utica, who who, uh, was was a slaveholder. But if you study people, you know, you you have to put them in perspective because he was a likable guy, but, you know, he had an enslaved person who I've written about separately. And I, in terms of live people, that's pretty much it. Yeah, Amari is a bunch of different people together. <sighs> price, price, price. Price is a price is a very interesting character too. That's that is definitely a, a true sense of the word. If we're if we're going to say anything, um, final question because I, I think this is the honestly the most important out of all of these is. Where can people find you? What are some of the big things that are coming up for you next? Um, well, people can find me if they can spell my name, which is not exactly easy. 
they can find me at deirdrecinet.com. Good luck with that. Um, I am working on a book called The, the uh, Loyalist's Wife, a novel of the American Revolution. I'm working on the third draft of that, set in 1777. And uh, it's very much a New York Mohawk Valley book. It's set out a, a manor. I didn't know when I was growing up. I didn't know when I was, I, even as an adult, I figured it out, found out that there were these manors in New York State where people were lords and ladies. Lord Safford, Lady Safford. And it's like, what? And did that go away after the revolution? And the answer is no. You, you will learn all about that because I had to learn all about it. Uh, when, whenever the next book gets published. Wow. Well, thank you again, Deirdre. We appreciate you being on here. It was lovely. I appreciate you. I appreciate you. And, and thank you so much. All right, folks. You, you heard it here. Everybody needs to go out. If you love historical fiction, specifically, if you love the 1800s, Go after the third Mrs. Galway, a novel by Miss Deirdre Sennett, and get it on your shelves. Become that hoarder. I mean, not hoarder. Uh, that um, sophisticated intellect. individual, sir. Sophisticated individual. The sophisticated individual, the intellectual sage that you are. Yes. Just don't look at this bookshelf because this bookshelf is pretty much just only Terry Pratchett and some manga. So like, Everybody's bookshelf's different. You don't have to do And that. not to mention, it broadens your imagination. It's supposed to help with the continuation of brain development. So I'm basically saving myself from Alzheimer's and dementia. Just saying. But more importantly, go grab an amazing historical fiction novel, dive into a little bit of history, and get two dueling personalities in it. Exactly. Ooh, nice recovery. See, the sage in her is actually coming out now. Oh, so, <laughs> <laughs> thank you, folks, for being here. We love you. We cherish you. Tell us what you thought about the episode. Leave the reviews. Follow us on our social media links. They're all over the place. All the uh, places that were spoken about will be in the descriptions and in the show notes. Go to our website, beyondthepinpodcast.com to see where you can find Miss Deirdre Sinnott at, where you can uh, receive a copy of your book, as well as all of her links and ours. And we will see you next time.